Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Atwal, and I am from the Indo-Canadian Women's Association. I'm wishing all of you a very happy International Women's Day, and let's give a round of applause for everybody that's showing up today. This is amazing. I cannot believe the turnout, and um, you know, I can't believe this all started with a small group of concerned citizens. Uh, just making, you know, taking their time to organize something like this. So if anybody ever doubted the impact of the individual, I think this is a testament to what is possible. So I just want to thank the organizing committee of Daughters Day and Mr. Batia and Satya Das and Paula Kerman and um, Kushali and give, give them a round of applause for everything at the Institute, Alex. It's amazing what can be done. So I'm really just inspired and touched to. So thank you for coming, it's um, amazing. Um, like I said, my name is Sabrina and I'm going to be the MC. I'm just introducing all of our wonderful guests today. Uh, we have uh, Phyllis Sinclair, who is the winner of the 2011 CAMA Awards for Best Folk Acoustic Album. Her album is here as well for sale. Yeah. And um, we also have a fun interactive session with Ask Your Auntie with the Aboriginal Women Professional Association. And some of the women are here. If you can just uh, wave your hand so we know who you are. Thank you for coming and it will be a great session. <laughs> Lots to learn from from you ladies. So thank you for coming. Um, and then we'll have maybe later on 7.40. So thank you again for coming. And uh, my name is Sabrina. If you have any questions, let me know. That's Paula taking the picture. She's, if anybody wants to follow up with any kind of communication or anything afterwards, we're going to have uh, three or four more sessions of this later on. And you know, Paula's the one to contact if you want to be involved or if you want to suggest a speaker. Um, so she's the one. So thank you again. And I'm introducing now Phyllis and Claire. Thank you very much. What a pleasure to be here today. I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time, and uh, the day has finally arrived, and I'm extremely uh, glad to be here. Now, we've had a bit of uh, a couple of sound issues, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to hear uh, my guitar. We're, we're unable to get sound out of it um, through, the, through the system, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll make the best of it. Well, I've selected a, a number of songs for you this evening that have to do with women. Um, women in different facets and women in different, uh, I guess, ways of thought. I'm going to start off with one tonight that talks about a woman who has really made her impression here in Alberta um, in a way that uh, is a little bit unusual. You'll get it as we get into the song. I can't hear my guitar. Can you hear it? Okay, good. She sits in the crevice, waiting for morning, awaiting the sun and her day to begin when she'll rise again. On the prairie wind, she's in no hurry, she drinks in the dew. Watches the sagebrush drink the vento in the badland day. What a pretty thing. She's over a road, she's strong and she's free. A wild natural beauty, flower of the She follows the sun to the great rocky mountains. There she can bathe in the pools and the fountains, past the foothills green. All day to dream. She waltzes through ranch land, valleys and barns, flaunting her beauty. She's working her charm on the Amalite. Her jewel delight. She's Albert Rose, she's strong and she's free. A wild natural beauty, flower of the prairie. Ah. Uh 
brush is the ice fits heading for Zama. Ways in the shoreline of Lake Athabasca in the ancient pines. Under autumn skies, northern wind blowing, she takes a rest, satisfied knowing she gave us her best, then she fades away. But she'll come again. She's Albert Rose, she's strong and she's free, a wild natural beauty. Flower of the prairie Ah, 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 Freely she gives us Full knowing she'll wither and die Return to the earth There we knew in the circle of life then she'll rise and grain, ripe and harvest, gemstones and daughters. Appearing once more to get back to Albert's soul. Waiting for morning, awaiting the sun and her day to begin when she'll rise again on the prairie wind. Oh, what a fine-looking bunch of people here this afternoon. Really nice to be in your presence. There's just a really nice warm energy in here. Can I just that? Well, I was raised by, by two very strong women. I was raised by my mother and my grandmother in the little tiny town of Churchill, Manitoba, which sits on the coast of the Hudson Bay. And... Um, we had to leave our little town of Churchill in 1967 because the army had pulled out a town that was a main employer of our town. And that meant that everybody had to absolutely leave and go and find work elsewhere if you wanted to work. And so my mother and my grandmother uprooted from Churchill, the place that we felt so safe at, and uh, moved us to Winnipeg. It was uh, just a couple of months later when my aunt decided to follow as well. My aunt was a commercial cleaning woman in the city of Winnipeg. And at about 5.30 at night, she'd get her shopping bag, and she'd walk down to the bus stop and take the bus downtown so that she could be at the office towers of the city of Winnipeg by about 6 o'clock, just as everybody else was leaving. Because that was her time. That was her time to go to work. About 11.30 at night, the reverse would happen. She'd come down from the towers, head down to the street, to the bus stop, take the last bus home, and this would go repeat itself day after day. She was a hard-working woman. One day I decided to uh, pay my aunt a visit, and I was sitting in her kitchen. And I was looking at her hands, and I noticed that the commercial cleaning woman and the, the I guess, the detergents that she used had really taken a toll on her hands. And I said to my aunt, I said, you know, aunt, auntie, I said, I just am so intrigued by people's hands. I said, I look at their hands and, and it just tells me so much about their life. And she said to me, she said, me too. She said, I like looking at people's hands because I see the same thing. And um, a few years later, my aunt passed away. I was up in my bedroom and I was just working on my guitar, just doing some practicing. And as I was practicing, this line popped into my head. 
And I couldn't help but feel at that moment that that was my aunt paying me a visit. And I felt it was a gift from her, and I decided to run with this song. Oh, now we're getting something. <laughs> She's back. She's back. Thank you, Auntie. And we got Auntie's here tonight too. That's terrific. <laughs> I just heard a string up. I think that's the one.
guitars are finicky instruments. They really need time to warm up to a room, otherwise they're, they're all over the place. We'll try to keep her happy. I've heard it said that um, it takes a woman or a person at least five times to end a bad relationship. And I can understand that. I can understand that because whenever you enter into rela a relationship, you have all these hopes for your, for your relationship, right? And uh, so you have these wonderful visions of how happy you're going to be. And when things start to get rough and you know that, oh, this might not be right, you really hate to give up on your dream. And then the second thing is that you always hope for change. You know, you think, you know, just stick this out long enough, things have got to get better. So that's number two. Then you go on and um, you decide, you know, it really might be time to take care of myself. And, uh, but then you got no money. <laughs> and it's harder to leave again. So there are a number, I can see why it takes at least up to five times for a woman uh, to leave a, a bad relationship. And uh, I was giving some thought to this a few years ago because, um, like most women, you know, I've made my mistakes too. And uh, so this is for, uh, for you women who've had uh, the courage to, uh, to take care of yourself. Is it my imagination? Am I really here at the station? Ready to go. I can't believe my determination. Never thought this recreation. Love.
So a few years ago, I was um, in the city of Winnipeg in the North End. I attended a funeral. And uh, when I arrived there, I had to make a quick trip to get there in time for it to start. And when I arrived at the Aboriginal Centre in the North End of Winnipeg, I was really quite surprised, and I really shouldn't have been, that there were so many people at the funeral. And in fact, they were sort of pouring out onto the streets. And uh, so anyway, I walked in, and up at the, at the front of the funeral hall, funeral centre, um, there was a microphone and um, people were invited to come up and pay their last respects and tell stories um, about this woman who had passed away. I knew her very well because she was a cousin of mine. She had hit hard times in the city of Winnipeg, but um, in spite of it all, she decided to use her gifts. And I believe that. I believe that every single one of us, despite our lot in life, where we stand, how much money we have, it doesn't matter, we all have gifts and we, cho we can choose to use them whichever way we like. And that's ex exactly what she decided to do. She decided to take the gift that she had and use it for uh, the community in her town in the north end of Winnipeg. I was very, um, it was heartwarming to hear one story that, went, that uh, one person told at the microphone, and that was this. That the city of Winnipeg had decided to call their goose population. They were just making too much of a mess. In the, in the parks. So the city of Winnipeg called up the Aboriginal Centre and said, listen, we have all these geese, we need to get rid of them. You know, we think that it would be nice traditional food for you, so if you want to come down at such and such a time, come, we'll hand out the geese to your elders and to anybody else who wants to come down and pick up the goose. Well, Hannah got wind of this, and she thought, that's terrific. I know people in need, I can go down and I can pick up some geese for some people. So down she went and she picked up three geese. And that's not so unusual, except that Hannah didn't own a car. She drove a bike. <laughs> that's right. And I can only imagine you, you know, I get this picture of her in my mind of maybe one in a backpack, but the other two I just see hanging down the handlebars. Don't you know? <laughs> what else could you do? But we all have our gifts, don't we? And uh, so did she. So.
She knew how to do anything that you can think of. She did beadwork. She knew how to tan, you know, uh, tan hides. She spoke the language. She uh, she worked really, really hard. And um, my grandmother was a very devout Anglican. And one of the things that she she made sure that we did was go to church on Sunday. She never wanted us to miss church on Sunday. Now, whether or not you observe Sunday as a religious uh, holiday or relig religious day or not, doesn't really matter. I just realized that later on in life, as I was growing up, that Sundays really were a very special day, you know? Not because we just went to church, because in our town, in our house, Sundays was a day of rest. And absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, got done on a Sunday. My grandmother wouldn't even pick up a needle on a Sunday. It was quiet, you know? Like, what do you do? And um, I was just thinking about that last winter, and I thought about those Sundays and how quiet they were, and how now it's so nice to have a day where you do absolutely nothing but reflect. You know, I think we all need that day. You know, I'm all for you know shopping and stuff like that, but I still think we need a day to just just do absolutely nothing. Quiet of that day, my mind would drift away, sitting on the back doorstep with time to wonder what. How high does the sun hang up there in the sky? Where did it come from, and how did it get its light? What's inside the ocean, and what makes your weight sigh? Time for the questions of the child. Shadows grew my world blue open wide. Come evening after supper with the candle low. 
I pull a flannel sheet back from my window. I felt the cool evening chill. The night was just as still as daytime after church. We left in our cigar. Why is there dust on the wings of a butterfly? Run right. Time for the questions of a child. Sundays in that town have never left my mind. Cut through all the places that I've left behind. What six days didn't give, my quiet Sundays did. Opened up my eyes and kept me mystified. Of all the days of the week, I remember Sunday best. Thank you so much. Back between the 1960s and the 1980s, was a time in Canada's history that is very tragic. Now, we've had a tr bit of a tragic history in terms of, um, you know, cultural relationships and so on, but this time was, in, was uh, tragic uh, even more. And that's because during the 1960s to the 1980s, as wards of the state, as a status Indian, the government felt that it was okay if a child was in, in a situation that they felt was dangerous or, you know, that that they could come in, and they could pick you up and take you wherever they wanted. They didn't have to tell your family, they didn't even have to have permission to take you somewhere else. And as a result of that, between the 1960s to the 1980s, many thousands of Canadian Aboriginal children were taken uh, and adopted outside of their province, outside of their country, and sometimes even outside of North America. And the tragedy of that is that once the children were um, uh, adopted, that oftentimes the book was closed. So that if the child wanted to go back and find out where they came from, who their family was, it was almost impossible. And uh, to this day, we have children that call themselves the survivors of the 60s scoop. And uh, they have sort of joined together. You can find their, their, uh, their group page on Facebook. It's very moving to go there. I belong to that that particular group, and uh, I see their posts, and many, many struggle to find out who they are, even to this day, even though they found their way back to Canada. I was at a, a funeral uh, in, back in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, and uh, this, uh, my cousin came up to me, and she said, I'd like to introduce you to a nephew of yours. I said, okay. So up toward me comes this young man, handsome, hair about down to here, just shiny, rich black hair. Anyway, I said, hi, how are you? And he said, well, I'm fine, how y'all doing? <laughs> I thought, this is not a typical Indian cousin. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I got to know him a little bit and uh, came to hear his story. When I got home, you know, I went back to my computer, went online, read about the 60s scoop and found out a number of different stories. You know, some kids were, one story was a woman, uh, a young man in fact was taken to live from Saskatchewan to British Columbia, and all his life he was raised to believe he was Italian. 
And when he finally found out about himself, he found out he was from the Piapot Reserve, which is that <laughs> They're kind of funny. Um, but I thought, you know, it must take a lot of courage for anybody, whether you're Aboriginal or not, or part of the 60s coup, to go back somewhere to find out who you are. You know, that's courageous, really courageous. And uh, I thought about, about him and his journey, and I thought, you know, he must have wondered, who am I? Do I speak the language? Does my family speak the language? Are we rural? Are we urban? Um, are we hunters, trappers? Do we speak the language? And what if they don't want me? You know, just all those many questions. And I thought about that, and uh, I, uh, I went home and I'm just trying to get rid of that bass. My, my bass string is really blue. It's a little bit better. So I thought about that and I wrote this. It's called Finding Ontario. And I named it that, not because Ontario is any different from any other province. It's just that Ontario is where Parliament sits. And it's where all the decisions are made. And I thought, um, we need to change. We don't need these things to happen anymore. I'm not 
I see that my time is, is up now, but uh, thank you so much for coming out. It's just really great to see all of you here. Oh yeah, I'll do one more for you. Um, I'll do two more if you like. <laughs> um, but thank you so much to the Carrot for opening up your spot to us. Thank you so much to the uh, International Women's Day Organizing Committee for putting this together where we can celebrate women, our womanhood, and the strides that we have made over the last 50 years. And uh, we still have a lot of work to go, but we're doing it. And I believe that we do it in our homes. We do it in our communities. And we make little changes by the life that we live. That's, that's my motto. But on we go. We have a long way to go, but we're getting there. So I'm going to leave you with this song. And uh, hopefully it's a feel-good song for you. Um, my grandmother, uh, like I said, was a huge influence on my life. And I believe that it's because of her that I am a morning person. And, uh, and I'll tell you why. Some of you will know this because I know there are some Churchillians here. Saturday morning, the train used to come in. Now it came three times a week, but Saturday was the main train. And the reason for that is it would bring the hunters and trappers and their families from what we call down the line into our town of Churchill to pick up their supplies for the rest of the week. As it turns out, many of those hunters and trappers were aunts, uncles, extended family that worked down the trap line. And inevitably, they would end up at our house on a Saturday morning. And I used to love to go down to the train station to meet the train because it was a community event. You know, you go down to the train station on a Saturday morning and the kids would be playing tag on the platform and the elders would be, you know, meeting amongst each other and talking and the young people would be sort of flirting up in the corner, you know? It was just one of those times. But every once in a while, this sleepy-headed seven-year-old girl just decided that, you know, I think I'll just sleep in this morning. And uh, that's what I would do. But it wouldn't be long before Half asleep, I could hear noise. I could hear the front door of our old house opening. And I could hear the shuffling of bags as they were being put down. I could hear the murmuring of voices. It wouldn't be long until I could hear the kettle being put on our old wood stove. I could smell the smell of coffee and back in the oven. And I could hear voices laughing. And they would be talking amongst each other and telling them, telling about the funny things that happened to them on the trap line that week. And as a six year, seven year old girl, I can't tell you what that did for me. As I lay in my bed, I felt like I was so safe and that I could do absolutely anything in the world. Thanks for coming out. Nothing sounds
peace or a lullaby Nothing sounds so good as morning laughter Morning laughter Morning laughter 